All right, um, morning everybody. Um, I'm Louise and today at our team journal club, I'm going to be presenting um, a paper, Non-Negative Spatial Factorization Applied to Spatial Genomics by William Towns and Barbara Engelhart. Um, this is published in Nature Methods in 2022. Um, so an overview of this paper is they introduce a method called NS NSF, which means, stands for Non-Negative Sp Spatial Factorization Method. Um, they demonstrate the ability of non-negative factorization to identify parts-based representations um, in simulations of spatial data and also kind of like demonstrate the utility of the factorization in spatial data. And then they benchmark their method um, on three spatial data sets, including um, SlideSeq, XYZ Seq, and 10X Visium data sets. Uh, so I guess quick, um, so this paper has a lot of math in it. Um, I am not going to delve too deeply into the mathy parts, um, but I guess quick to, to like touch on like what non-negative matrix factorization out. It's like, again, a part space representation of like complex data. So basically being able to say that like matrix X times matrix H equals matrix V. And of these three matrices, none of them can have negative components. Um, so like if V was like your data and you want to break it down into different components that you want to study individually, uh, maybe for us, like a spatial data, we want to study one layer or something, you can kind of extract that. Um, uh, so it gets pretty complicated, but basically what they're saying is that like, if this math can work with like real numbers, which means everything that's like positive or negative, or it can work if it's, I guess there's a subset of solutions to like one of these multiplications that like works if all of the elements are positive. And it's like a smaller set of solutions, but it's also way easier to, um, I guess, interpret like biologically. Um, so they break down a bunch of different methods in this paper. Um, so there's just like factor analysis, there's Mephisto or Mephisto. I'm not quite sure how that's to pronounce, be pronounced. Um, but anyway, this is a spatially aware dimension reduction method, um, also published in 22. Um, and then the they present like the, the NSF is like the main method that they're presenting, but they also have like kind of a hybrid mode um, for NSF, which is NSFH. Um, so where they say that like, Okay, so these sets are both like the spatial components, but then also non-spatial components. So they demo that as well. And then they also have a probabilistic ver version or um, and then RSF, which is the real value spatial factorization to by my understanding is the one that can include negative values. Um, okay, so the first thing that they do is like demo that these methods like are useful for understanding, I guess, like spatial data. And what they do is they um, kind of create these little spatial patterns and they say, this is the ground truth. And then they simulate counts over the ground truth. So like, this was kind of my understanding of the simulation is that like for the features, they have 200 features and they assign them to the different shapes. So like gene one, for instance, would have like zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, and on and on um, across like the 2D spatial little grid that they have here. Um, so that these genes would, like the expression of these genes would like vary based on the shapes that they get assigned to. So then backing up, they end up with count data that is like, has has these shape patterns contained within it. Um, and basically what they do is they try to extract these features using these different methods and then like show what that would look like. So they show that for like factorization and a Mephisto. <laughs> um, if anybody has a better pronunciation for that, let me know. Um, they kind of show that like you get, you can see the patterns that like kind of exist within it, but it's like they're not assigned to the right ones and they're like more complex than the patterns that like really truly exist in the ground truth. And I guess something that wasn't like totally clear to me from this, um, uh, I think like the negative is red. Um, so like you can see the patterns, but they're like more complex and they're more like mixed up. You don't get like a one-to-one -one 
match back. So that was like FA and Mephisto. <clears throat> and then for NSF, you see like a clear recapitulation of like their little patchwork patterns that they have up here. So they're saying that like this NFS method, like better identifies the patterns as separate factors. Um, likewise for the PNFF and then RSF again, which I think is like that real values does not find it. And then clustering, interesting. Uh, they find like kind of the, in the like intersections that happen across these patterns. So like, I guess this was maybe what we're maybe more familiar with, but they like find, so like these little corners where this oversects in the count data, like that's unique, right? That only happens like once. These corners, this little cross pattern. So this is maybe what we're more used to looking at, whereas like these complex patterns exist in the count data, but they exist at the same time. And the factorization helps you pull out these like uh, unique patterns, but they also can overlap, which I guess like kind of, could contain like the biological complexity. So that was kind of my takeaway from this. So it's like, um, basically what they found is that like the kind of like the real value and like the factorization can lead to like really complex patterns that aren't like, not really what's there. It's like a more complex overlap and the real values can give you like some false impressions of what might be there. Clustering finds like the weird, like finds intersections of these patterns. And then like the non-negative models identify pat like identify the patterns separately and can like recapitulate the ground truths. So that that was my takeaway from this. Um yeah. So then moving on to the benchmark, um they have three different data sets that they kind of like picked out because they um I guess these are different spatial texts. Um I've heard of slide seek and visium, X Y Z seek was new to me. Um, but they kind of like mentioned that there is a kind of like um, variation over like how big the field of views are for these. Slide seek being very tiny, Visium being, uh, you know, medium, XYZ seek being able to like contain a bigger piece of tissue. And then the resolution from finest slide seek to Visium, the, uh, I guess the resolution we're used to kind of a, like a kind of three to four cell mixture on each point. And then XYZ seek, which being the largest. Um, so they kind of have that diversity in their data sets. Um, they're going to test the data by splitting their training data into a 95 to 5% training test split. And then they are going to ask, or I evaluate methods by a goodness of fit quantified with Poisson distribution. Um, so observed counts and validation versus predicted mean values of the model fit. And then a small deviance from that model is a good fit, good performance from the method. And they also are going to vary the number of components, I guess like the number of different patterns they're looking for in the data. Um, and that's kind of like, um, so they can go from like less complex to more complex. Um, so this was their benchmark results on the slide seek. Um, so I guess, again, smaller deviance is better. And I guess what they found here is that FA, Mephisto and RSF is actually has the smaller deviance here. Um, but they do argue that the unsupervised models have higher deviance than their uh, analogs. So I think like um, FA is like worse. Um, and then like the PNFS is like worse than um, these like the, the spatial versions. So that's like a point, point for the spatially aware methods. Um, and they also argue that I guess it's in the next one that I guess this is another issue we run into benchmarks as well. If you use a different metric here, RMSE, rather than the Poisson distribution, then they actually have better performance from NSFS than um, these other models. So they they give they give NSF and NSFH a point there. Um, so I guess a mixed bag on slide seek, um, but they show that like it does perform better than the non-spatially aware methods. And then another thing that they point out at the bottom here in these histograms is, so this is the spatial importance score given to each gene um, and then the number of genes, so histogram, and we see the distribution. And what they argue is that most genes have some spatial importance. A few are like totally spatially dependent. A few have like not, not a lot of spatial dependence, but most are like here around like 0.75. So like most genes are seeing like some spatial dependence in this data. And then I think they have a second one, number of observations versus that spatial importance score, and you see the same distribution. So they're saying that like uh, most genes strongly spatially variable. Um, so 
like understanding the spatial variability like is really important in this data. Um, yeah, so again, just pointing out the RMSE. Um, and they, this was one of their extended figures. Uh, fun in this paper where there's extended figures and supplemental figures. So uh, lots, lots of stuff to look at. Um, so then, yeah, so then figure three, they um, are looking at like, okay, biologically, what can we tell from this data? Like how can like the factors like tell us what's going on? Um, so I think that a nice example up here is that it pulls out the spatial factors map to specific brain regions, and they point out a couple of distinct brain regions in this mouse brain. Um, so num number one being the choroid plexus, number six being the medial habenula, um, uh, eight being the dente gyrus, and then 10 being this really thin Menendez layer. Um, so you can like point them out. And then they also show that like using that like spatial importance, uh, they find like the spatially variable genes and you can see these kind of map back to these same, uh, I guess like brain regions um, that they pull out in A. And then at, in C here, they're showing the non-spatial factors. So things that they're like, I guess genes that they're able, genes and factors that were like non-spatial and you can see that like way more fuzzy, way more staticky. I would argue that you can almost pull out a couple features in these, but it's way less clear, right, than A, which is like the actual spatial features. Um, so again, this NSFH being the model that identifies spatial and non-spatial factors. So kind of demoing all of the things you can pull out with that model. Um, so then they have a supplemental figure that kind of like um, corresponds to this figure three where they show kind of like the other methods trying to do a similar thing. So we're also trying to identify, um, I guess, so this is like the factors identified by PNMF. Um, so you can see some of the same patterns, but they're less clear. Um, and then you can see at the bottom, this is the Scampi clustering. Um, and again, it doesn't pull out as many of like the distinct regions. Um, and then like the factor analysis and the real value spatial factorization, uh, again, do a worse job and weren't able to identify distinct regions. Um, so yeah, the NF, the NSFH spatial factorization is kind of being the most clear, uh, best uh, identification of those mouse brain regions. And then um, figure four, NSFH and XYZ data. So again, they're trying to like, show these factors. Um, so I'm, you know, we're less familiar with XYZ data, um, but they point out that they're able to identify normal liver, which I believe was A1, versus um, tumor, like normal liver tissue versus tumor patterns here. And then likewise, able, able to identify the spatially variable genes that match these patterns. Um, so like, you know, tumor, I guess this gene is like important for the tumor identified here, and then also the non- um, spatial factors. And then figure five, which I think is maybe the most pertinent to our group, um, which is the Visium benchmark, benchmark. And basically the conclusion here is that NSF works well on Visium data. So if we look at our um, uh, validation deviance, again, low being better, um, we see that NSF, NSF is the lowest deviance, close to RSF, but um, is at best, it also has, um, RSF has uh, RMSE, so again, those two metrics, but these two models performed really well on Visium, um, and then NSF outperforming uh, NSFH on Visium, which was not always the case previously. Again, they get a similar distribution for spatial importance. If anything, there's more genes that have like higher spatial importance score than we saw from SlideSeq. Um, but most have some, like around 7.75 of that spatial importance score. Um, so again, seeing that same pattern. Um, and then zooming in and actually looking at what these spatial factors look like in spatial plots. Um, so again, A, we're seeing the spatial, the spatial factors map to some nice brain regions. Um, B, these top uh, genes associated with these spatial factors, again, kind of recapitulating um, these brain regions that they identify. And then C was their non-spatial factors again. These do look more spatial than the slide seek ones, and they talk about that. 
um, they say a few of the non-spatial factors exhibit spatial localization, and they kind of argue that the lower resolution visium may cause rare spatial factors to be misclassified as non-spatial factors. So that might be a bit of an issue with these methods um, meshing here. Um, so that's kind of a, I guess like these, the tech is like really important for the performance of these and kind of some of the um, conclusions you can draw. Um, yeah, so in conclusion, um, they present this non-negative non factors are more easier, easily interpretable than um, uh, other factorization of spatial data. NSF is introduced as a spatially aware dimension reduction method. Um, spatial and non-spatial factors can be modeled with NSFH, which is the hybrid NSF, and um, you can kind of derive different conclusions from the different uh, factors you draw from data. Um, spatial factors can define brain region and tissue types um, and different types of the spatial data. NSF was our strongest performance in Visium data and the whole pipeline, they have code available to implement all of this in TensorFlow. Um, all right, with that, we can move on to questions. And I think some questions for us to discuss, how can we use NSF and can this replace or supplement spatial clustering in our work? Um, oh, yeah. Awesome, Luis. Um, just going to screenshot a tiny bit. Citation seven that they have on the paper um, is actually this other paper here from 1999, um, where they talk about like non non negative factor, uh, non negative um, factorization. And they say like in images, you can like get back like pieces of, of a face, whereas like PCA or other methods like give you like um, a pattern that's like across the whole face instead of like segments of the face. Yeah. So yeah, this was interesting to see. Yeah, that's a cool way of kind of thinking about it. Like it's less abstract almost. I guess like in some of those patterns, I'm seeing like eyes, 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 noses, chins versus like the PCA, which is like kind of hot regions. Like, so. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. I'll stop the recording now. <laughs>